Marvin Goldfried is a distinguished professor of psychology at Stony Brook University, where he helped develop the graduate program in clinical psychology. He's the co-founder of the Society for the Exploration of Psychotherapy Integration. Alan Francis is a professor of psychiatry and chair emeritus at Duke and was chair of the DSM-4 task force. Marvin describes the evolution of his psychotherapy orientation as psychodynamic, behavioral, CBT, and eventually integrative. He practices, teaches, and supervises what works clinically using direct and indirect evidence base. Alan describes his approach to psychotherapy as whatever works or no one size fits all. He was trained and taught at the Columbia University Psychoanalytic Center, but remains equally interested in brief, supportive, cognitive, behavioral, interpersonal, and family therapies. Please enjoy this week's episode. Good morning and welcome to Talking Therapy with Marvin Goldfried and his esteemed colleague. Hey, Marvin. Always good to see you. Alan Francis. Oh, yeah, that's right. You didn't forget, right? Sometimes. The last thing to go at our age. <laughs> I'm, I'm getting close. Names, especially our own. Anyway, this is this is going to be a, a fun podcast, like other other podcast but i think this one in particular because it's an interesting topic and that is complicated grief um, is there such a thing uh is it different from depression how do we treat it and i know you've had lots of experience with this through dsm uh what was that brought up when you were chair of dsm the whole notion of using that diagnosis yeah the, there's been great pressure going back to um I guess the late 80s, early 90s, to include complicated grief. It's very understandable why um, researchers and some clinicians find this very valuable. Uh, actually, going back to Freud, Freud wrote a, a, a monograph called Mourning and Melancholia, I think 1914, in which he described the difference between normal mourning, and which was not clinical, part of everyday life, mm -hmm. and melancholia, which is clinical and, and may require treatment. Uh, in, in the DSM-4 process, there were strong arguments made that there are a group of people who uh, experience, after the loss of a loved one, uh, symptoms that are pervasive, uh, persistent, disabling, and that complicated grief is a way of identifying them and providing them with suitable treatment. And the people doing the research were mostly in, engaged in psychotherapies, although there was some... Um, interest in medication for complicated grief. Now, we rejected it outright. And the reason we rejected it, the best parallel is caffeine dependence. We, we did not include caffeine dependence in dsm 4 Why? Well, 90 million people in America may have caffeine dependence. This is my cue, right? It's a very- drink my coffee. <laughs> there you go, suggestion. The power of suggestion. Um, and some people really get in trouble because of caffeine intoxication and mm -hmm. um, heart trouble, anxiety disorders. Um, it would be useful to have a, a diagnosis of caffeine dependence in DSM to deal with the small group of people, the small percentage of people who get in trouble. But if we included it, we'd be trivializing the diagnostic process and creating a vast army of false positives, people who, need to drink coffee, but it doesn't really mm -hmm. um, affect their lives in a way that calls for clinical attention. And we felt that we wanted to avoid the vast false positive problem. And in so doing, we might be neglecting the needs of a small group of people who do have caffeine dependence in a way that's harmful. But overall, if you take the greatest good for the greatest number, it was a mistake to include it. Well, Similarly, is that the same reasoning with de uh, uh, deciding not to put in complicated grief? Yeah, it's the exact same reasoning. That of course, there are people who have um, pervasive and persistent and disabling symptoms after grief. Of course, they need clinical attention, but they could already be covered in the system under the rubric of major depressive disorder. And if we included complicated grief as a separate category, it very likely would lead to the vast overdiagnosis of people experiencing normal grief, a huge false positive problem. 
and in doing this, several terrible things would happen. One is it would be in a way pathologizing normal grief. It's a way of robbing the dignity. You've lose, lost the love of your life. The person, your soulmate, you're devastated by that. That's part of the human experience. We shouldn't be invading into normality and calling that a psychiatric disorder. Well, you know, people have been making a very similar argument with, with depression, with other kinds of losses of, of pathologizing that. And they're absolutely right. And this gets to what happens, what happened with DSM-5 uh, in a minute. They're absolutely right that uh, we shouldn't be calling every experience of sadness, disappointment, uh, uh, grief. Uh, we shouldn't be calling these mental disorders when they're perfectly understandable, normal human reactions to loss and disappointment. And so we left it out. We did not include it in DSM-4. We did have a section for disorders that might warrant future research. It was included there. The same process happened with DSM-5, and it was not included in DSM-5 for similar reasons. It will be included in DSM-5-TR. It is included in ICD-11. And I think what this means is the expansion, the constant pressure to expand the diagnostic system to include every painful human experience. And the downside of this, as I mentioned a moment ago, partly is to take normal grief and make it into a sickness. And, and yeah, there's yeah. more controversy about complicated grief. About DS, what DSM-5 did was not add complicated grief, but it made it easier to call grief depression. A very <laughs> short period of time, just two weeks, of fairly mild symptoms by DSM-5 would no, after the loss of a loved one, would no longer be considered uh, part of normal grief. It could easily be called major depressive disorder. DSM-5 TR has added complicated grief. And so there's a gradual expansion into normal human emotions, uh, calling them clinical. And the, the, aside from the lack of of um, respect for the mammalian tendency to experience pain upon the loss of love, it also opens the door for drug companies to start pushing medication. Yeah, people who are grieving. So this, this Alan, this clarifies uh, things for me as far as your thinking, because I was wondering what you had against it, but not, but I could certainly see that. So you're you're not saying that it does not exist. You're saying that codifying it can create all kinds of headaches. Exactly. In other words, and but what but you know one of the problems is, and this I think is maybe less of a problem nowadays, is that there was a period of several decades when the NIMH would not fund any research unless it had a DSM diagnosis. So here's a clinical phenomenon that exists and has, and clinicians know that it exists, uh, and it's very frustrating because. Research on it um, is not being funded. It, it gets worse. I mean, I think this is maybe a, too big a topic for, for just today, but why should you need a necessarily need a medical diagnosis, a DSM diagnosis to get psychotherapy? Yeah, well, I, I, I did research in the, in the 60s and 70s on phenomenon that were not DSM, like unassertiveness or procrastination or, or um, uh, examination anxiety. And it was, you know, we, we came up with very interesting findings. But then I got site visited by Barry Wolf of the NIMH, and he said, Mark, we're not going to fund you anymore for this. You've got to have a diagnosis. We had manuals, but we didn't have a diagnosis. Now, I think that that was a terrible mistake. It's one Freud anticipated that um, in Berlin in the uh, in the aughts and early teens, they began opening psychoanalytic clinics. And he was worried that if they got state funding, the uh, process of doing the treatment would be distorted. And what we have now in, in the States is that because psychotherapy is funded only as a medical treatment, it requires a medical diagnosis. And this distorts the whole process leading people to regard as medical problems things that are really problems in life, which psychotherapy is very suited for, cost-effective, uh, 
useful for the society to be providing psychotherapy for those problems in life. But it's a mistake, I think, to, to require that they be called medical disorders. Yeah. No, that's a, that certainly is a is a hot issue. But let, let's not go there because I, I think there's much more. It would be helpful for us to talk about with re- specifically with regard to to complicated grief. You know, an interesting an interesting experience I had was God was like uh, forty years ago, a little over forty years ago. I was on sabbatical in San Francisco Bay Area, and uh, at um, Langley Porter, they had a clinic run by Marty Horowitz, and one of the psychiatrists that worked there was Charles uh, Charlie Marmer. And it was for stress and anxiety. And I vividly remember over lunch with, with, with Marmer, him saying, you know, we see a lot of people who are anxious because of the failure to grieve. Uh, and this is missed by a lot of clinicians. And he was lamenting this over 40 years ago. That, that this could be missed clinically. And I think, you know, one of the side effects of, um, of it not being a DSM is that, that a lot of clinicians miss it. And I don't know how much experience you've had. I have had about a handful of cases of this. Well, I think the, the best way of dealing with a complicated situation where everything you do will create problems. For me, the best way is, is going back to what Freud wrote more than 100 years ago, to try to separate normal mourning, non-medical condition, from melancholia, which can be more comfortably classified as a clinical condition. And DSM allows that, that when someone has complicated grief, another way of seeing that is that's major depressive disorder, that the grief has at this point become severe enough, pervasive enough, disabling enough, it goes beyond what can be expectable for normal reactions to loss. And again, this has to be, let me just say one thing, this has to be culturally corrected. Uh-huh. But in some cultures, if, if someone grieves for the rest of their lives, that's perfectly normal. That to not do that would, would be cu- culturally asymptotic. That we have to take into account what's expected for that person at what point in life, like grieving for kids, it's it's a very different thing losing a child versus yes. losing a an aged parent. And in my experience, people who lose a child never get over that. Never get over it. No, it's in every right day. or or survivors of the Holocaust. Right, never get over it, and, and even generations after that. And, um, and, and, and just and, remind and, me again in in Freud's uh, paper, uh, "Morning and Melancholia," was the essential difference that with with um, melancholy or depression, it was he described it as a kind of a self anger, yeah, self blame. He, he gave he gave a, a pathogenetic explanation that had to do with the psychology of the person. I don't think that that's particularly useful at this point. I don't think that there's one set way to explain why someone has a much greater grieving reaction. Yeah. Than another person, except the circumstances we're just describing, that certain situations are such a, so absolutely outside human experience that um, they have a different impact on people, like losing a child, especially losing a child traumatically, or, or, or being in a, in a uh, um, environment that's uh, beyond the usual human experience. The people in camps in Syria, um, they're not going to leave those camps and then have happy lives. That this is something that will be with them. The loss of family members, the yeah. loss of their previous, will be with them. And I don't think it, it's useful to, to necessarily, at this point, have a separate diagnosis for complicated grief. I think when clinicians need to provide a diagnosis so that they, they can get reimbursed and so that they can treat the yeah. person, yeah. age depressive disorder would, serves just fine that adding complicated grief to the system, reducing the duration and severity requirements for grief means that lots of people will be seen as having a psychiatric illness who are really just losing a a, a crucial person in their lives and having perfectly normal reactions to it. Should some of those people get psychotherapy? For sure. Will medication help them? Maybe in some cases, but probably not in most. Yeah. I hesitate use, even using the word diagnosis. 
but not recognizing that certain symptomatology like depression and anxiety and emotional ability or sleep problems, things like that, not recognizing that this may be linked to the failure to grieve is, is serious because um, I remember one person I saw who for years was getting all kinds of other treatment that was not relevant. Right. And the only way I saw that link was that this person had a, a, a theme of loss in their life. And I think that was one of the kind of the indicators. There was a theme of loss. And then when there was a loss, there was a, an exacerbation of the anxiety and depression. And it turned out that this person never grieved for a significant other early on. And this sounds very weird, but we did grief work for that significant other. And she went to the cemetery and cried and things like that and looked at pictures of the, of the significant other and felt better. And the anxiety and depression went away. And it's like, it was like out of a movie, you know. That, uh, so, I, and I've seen similar things, and I haven't seen that many people, but uh, apparently other clinicians have. Yeah, actually, I have. It, it's uh, part of the work I did quite a bit. I, I did a lot of grief therapy in my career and was often referred to people who were grieving. And the, the treatment, again, goes back to Freud uh, more than 100 years ago, was, was catharsis. It goes back to Aristotle. Yeah. Do you think there's a kind of a hardwired need to grieve? Oh, yeah. yes. Well, for sure. Uh, well, first of all, it's not just human. It, it, it's mammalian. That Every creature that attaches in a mammalian kind of way, the price you pay for that experience of attachment and love is that you're going to feel a sense of loss when it's you're robbed of it. So elephants grieve. Mm -hmm. uh, dolphins yeah. grieve. Um, every pretty much every mammal that's been looked at has a grief experience when they lose a loved one. That this is part of not just the human experience, but a mammalian experience. And again, that's a reason for respecting it, not necessarily always pathologizing it. And I think what you just said about the treatments, exactly what Freud suggested, exactly Aristotle's explanation of why we go to tragedies, that the experience, the cathartic experience of feeling the love again, seeing the photographs. I always bring, ask people to bring me pictures, bring me videos. Yes, yes. Discuss the memories. Go back to the places that you were together. Uh -huh. Smell the clothing in the closet. Um, feel the feelings you once had for the person. Re-experience the love. Allow yourself to experience the loss. For many people, the crucial moment in the treatment is when they can cry. Yeah. Some people are so frozen and benumbed that they can't really experience it when they can begin to cry in the sessions and then outside the session, yeah. that's when they begin to be able to come to terms with the terrible. That, that's precisely the way I think about it. Sim very simply put, it's the failure to grieve. And then the question becomes, why, if it's a hardwired need to grieve and you don't grieve, then why are you not grieving? Well, fear. I'm afraid that if I start crying and really feel that pain, I will never stop crying if I start. Um, or um, every time I think of my lost parent, I get sad, but then I also get angry. So there's, there's a lot of blockage and things like that. So the, the therapy that, that I've always used and taught um, is to get rid of the blockages to allow the grieving. Yeah, a technical term, catharsis. And very often it's not hard. Um, sitting there and being sympathetic and giving people permission to feel what they, they feel but have... No, I disagree with you. It's very hard. I have found it extremely difficult uh, after a session to, to see somebody sobbing and in such pain. I mean, I... <laughs> It, it just is, is, is a difficult experience therapeutically. Yeah, I, didn't mean, the I didn't mean not hard for that. 
I think it can be very, it's very painful for the person while they're experiencing it. It can be very deeply moving for the therapist, but what's not hard is the dramatic results you often see. Yeah. Yes. So that yes. Very rarely in our work, do you see as big a change from session to session in a person's life as with someone who's grieving and able to experience it in the session when they haven't been able to do it outside. Yeah. I'll tell you something. I don't think I've ever told you this that you might find of great interest. Back in the 80s, there was this NIMH sponsored clinical trial comparing cognitive therapy for depression with interpersonal therapy, IPT. And one of the modules within interpersonal therapy is that if the person is depressed due to the failure to grieve, you do grief work. So that was part of not cognitive therapy, but IPT. So I once asked two of the four authors of the uh, cognitive therapy book, if you saw a patient who was depressed because of the failure to grieve, would you use cognitive therapy? And their response was, of course not. I said, what would you do? He said, I would do grief. They said, I would do grief work. Yeah. So there's this clinical thing that is going on that is, it is, some of it is in the literature. And there's a wonderful uh, book by Warden, W-O-R-D-E-N. I don't know his first name or the title of the book. Um, but he gives indications of how to spot complicated grief, depression that's due to complicated grief and how, and how to deal with it. And then, of course, you know the person who's, being do, who's doing the cutting edge work. Research work, right? Kathy Shear, sure. Kathy Shear. There, there are several uh, research groups. And, and actually, it's an interesting uh, issue that, like, Kathy's work is absolutely wonderful and very meaningful. And she was quite angry at me for my opposition to having it inc included in the DSM. We'd worked together for many, many years, had been close to one another. But she was angry at me for my strong opposition to this. And I think that it, it illustrates another broader point that anyone who's an expert in a field, who's highly committed to their work, highly committed to the patients they see in their research projects and in their clinical work, will feel the benefits of the diagnosis being included. And Kathy was certainly very alive to how important it was to have this included so that her patients would be recognized. But experts never notice the um, unintended negative consequences of the overdiagnosis of people that once you make any diagnosis official, it's going to expand its boundaries. And many people will be labeled as mentally ill who probably should not be labeled as mentally ill. So that in, in any field with every suggestion the experts in that field, the researchers will powerfully promote it because in their experience, they see only the benefits of that diagnosis. They don't experience the risk. And the risk here is very clear. Primary care docs, if you're a primary care doc and you have someone who's grieving and you make the diagnosis of complicated grief and there's no psychotherapist in your area to, you can refer to, which is the norm in America, it's very hard to find a psychotherapist you can refer to, especially if someone can't self-pay and doesn't have fancy insurance, what will you do? You'll give medication for it. Yeah. If the only tool you have is a hammer, you treat everything as if it were a nail. And it's the only way to get the patient out of the office in 15 minutes. The drug companies will be pouncing on this, trying to figure out ways to make this a new indication to sell product. So that the, um, the risks of overdiagnosing are ignored by experts in the field because they are legitimately concerned about the risks of underdiagnosing. And in their experience, they only see the benefits of the diagnosis. They, it's very hard for them to imagine all the risks. Did you ever explain that to? Yeah, explain. I've explained to experts thousands of times. I mean, I've, and did so she far. forgive you? No. Well, <laughs> as a friend, but not as a colleague. I think that I've I've worked with thousands of people in the diagnostic system. I've never had one of them ever say, you know, my diagnosis is subject to overuse and misuse. Why don't we make the criteria more stringent? so that it won't be applied to people in a way that may be harmful to them. That has never happened. That almost every expert I've ever met 
always wants their diagnostic criteria set expanded. I saw a patient last week or in our research clinic, we saw a patient last week and it didn't fit the DSM criteria and they really deserve the diagnosis. I've heard that hundreds, maybe thousands of times. I've never once had an expert come up and say, you know, my diagnosis is, is too easy to get. I'm really worried about the false positives who may be misdiagnosed. Maybe we should make the criteria a little tougher. No one's ever suggested we should take my diagnosis out of the DSM because it's being misused. Everyone's always clamoring to include their diagnosis. Well, let me, let me throw a question at you before we, we end today. A little bit out of left field, but but um, be curious as to, to your thoughts on it. I like um, the I like the image of you in left field. <laughs> left field, yeah. Ke catching the uh, I'm the, I'm the catcher, and you're throwing you're reach, to reaching the over out. the stands and and saving the uh, the you're thinking uh, of preventing standing, the home run. Yeah, you're thinking thanks. of Sandy Ambrose, but go ahead. <laughs> Okay. No one else will get that right. Okay. Uh, maybe it's also in right field or center field, but that wherever it's from, how close do you think complicated grief is to PTSD? Well, this is, uh, just 15 minutes ago, I was reading an article about the, uh, the death of um, Naomi Judd. And uh, she committed suicide about four months ago and the coroner's report came out and the family's response to it. She shot herself. She had bipolar disorder throughout her life. And they, they introduced the idea that she also had PTSD. That at this point, it's very um, easy to pile on diagnoses and to see each person is having multiple comorbidities. That the system has been so split into small pieces that individuals when they have any one problem can often seem to qualify for many other problems. Um, it, it's certainly true that if, if you've seen your child run over by a truck and smashed into a pancake on the road, that you're going to have both complicated grief and you're going to have PTSD. Yeah. No, I'm not talking about both, but I'm talking about some of the mechanisms. And it, I think it was once in, in one of the DSM, of versions, but I could, I could be wrong. Uh, and, and that was the definition of PTSD as having an event, having an, a, a stressful outside, event. Outside, that, that What's that? Outside normal experience. Outside the normal experience, yeah. Right, that, that you just can't get your head around. Well, that's the idea, that the, the diagnosis of PTSD has been broadened out of all recognition from what it intentionally, initially was meant to be. And initially it was to be for really extreme experiences of the kind I just mentioned, the terrible accidents, rape, yeah. uh, war experiences, not the death of your parent in the hospital at the age of 90, not expectable deaths even of a younger person, um, if it's expectable, it's part of life to lose someone to Hodgkin's cancer at 60. That's not really meant to be PTSD. It's a terrible trauma. It's a horrible source of life pain. Mm -hmm. It may cause complicated grief, but that's not meant to be the, the definition of PTSD. Yeah. Okay, so I guess the take-home message, if we wrap it up, is that, yeah, diagnosing something as complicated grief is, is a slippery slope and you can get false positives and you could, could uh, undermine something which is part of the human, pathologize something and make it outside the human experience. Um, but from a clinical point of view uh, and also the need for research on, that, on, on what works, um, the failure to grief can create all kinds of problems. Uh, and if that goes on over a period of time, then it might be a good idea to have some kind of intervention. And one of the problems is that we have to pathologize someone to, to get them psychotherapy. That, uh, well, that is a, that, my friend is a can of worms. Yeah. There are problems like, one last thing, in, in the, my opposition to the uh, loosening of the definition, the exclusion of grief as a, uh, reason for giving a diagnosis of major depression for DSM-5. The people working on DSM-5 said, well, you know what? When you have a divorce, 
that causes sadness, but we don't stop the diagnosis of major depression. Why should it be different for grief? It's exactly the point you made earlier, that many of life's losses can lead to yeah. the experience of grief and, and seeming major depression. Why don't we have them as exclusions? And my argument was we shouldn't make it easier to give the clinical diagnosis of grief in situations where the person's having an understandable human reaction. We should make it harder in these other situations to pathologize it. If someone has two weeks of feeling bad after losing their job, that's not a psychiatric condition. That's a life problem. Yeah. Should that person, does that person often deserve psychotherapy? Because that may help them for sure. But it shouldn't necessarily be a medical condition that's being treated. We shouldn't turn normal, expectable human experiences into mental disorder. Well, it's a political and even more important, an economic issue. And uh, But we'll end on that note, and, and hopefully uh, watchers and listeners uh, will have a bit of understanding of this. Uh, and I have to say, I have a better understanding. I do appreciate talking to you, Alan. Yeah, and one thing, just one last thing. I think that one of the ways to make this better would be to allow brief treatments without a medical diagnosis. That allowing people to have 10 treatments that are covered by insurance without a diagnosis That's would be interesting. cost effective. It would reduce the by far the amount of medication that's being used because people could get therapy they need instead of being forced into medication. And most people don't want more than or need more than five or 10 sessions to deal with problems of everyday life. Yeah, we could we could help people with psychotherapy for problems of everyday life. If we made brief treatment freely available without a medical diagnosis. Okay, on that note. See you, Mark. Take care. Next week. Stay safe. Bye bye. You too. Bye bye.